So the everyone. Welcome to the study group with Venerable Yutadama. Aham bante di sarane na saha panta sila ni ya chami. Dutiyampi aham bante di sarane na saha panta sila ni ya chami. Dutiyampi aham bante di sarane na saha panta sila ni ya chami. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Ti saranagamanang nititang. Ama bante. Arnati pata viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Panati pata viramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinna dana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Adinna dana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kami sumichaha jara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Kame sumi cha cha ra veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musa vada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura meraya majapamadathana veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura Miraya Madra Pamadatana Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyam Imani Pancha Sika Padani Silena Sukating Yanti Silena Bhoga Sampada Silena Niputing Yanti Tasma Silang Visodha Ye Sadhu 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 Sad, sad, sad. Chapter 39. The bowl food eater's practice is undertaking with one of the following statements. I refuse a second vessel or I undertake the bowl food eater's practice. When at the time of drinking rice gruel, the bowl food eater gets curry that is put in a dish. He can first eat the curry or drink the rice gruel. If he puts it in the rice gruel, the rice gruel becomes repulsive when a curry made with cured fish, etc., is put into it. 
So it is allowable to do this only in order to use it without making it repulsive. Consequently, this is said with reference to such curry as that. But what is unrepulsive, such as honey, sugar, etc., should be put into it. And in taking it, he should take the right amount. It is allowable to take green vegetables with the hand and eat them. But unless he does that, they should put into the bowl. Because a second vessel has been refused, it is not allowable to use anything else, not even the leaf of a tree. These are its directions. Number 40. This too has three grades. Herein, for one who is strict, except at the time of eating sugar cane, it is not allowed while eating to throw rubbish away, and it is not allowed while eating to break up rice lumps, fish, meat, and cakes. The rubbish should be thrown away, and the rice lumps, etc., broken up before starting to eat. The medium one is allowed to break them up with one hand while eating, and he is called a hand ascetic. The mild one is called a bowl ascetic. Anything that can be put into his bowl, he is allowed while eating to break up, that is, rice lumps, etc., with his hand, or such things as palm sugar, ginger, etc., with his teeth. And the moment any one of these three agrees to a second vessel, his ascetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. 31. The benefits are these. Craving for variety of tastes is eliminated. Excessiveness of wishes is abandoned. He sees the purpose and the right amount in nutriment. He is not bothered with carrying saucers, etc. About his life confirms to the principles of fewness of wishes and so on. 42. He baffles doubts that might arise with extra dishes, downcast eyes, the true devotedness imply, of one uprooting gluttony, wearing content as if thwere part of his own nature, glad at heart. None but a ball food eater may consume his food in such a way. This is the commentary on the undertaking directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the ball food eaters practice. 43. The later food refusers practice is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse additional food or I undertake the later food refusers practice. Now, when that later food refuser has shown that he is satisfied, he should not again have the food made allowable by having it put into his hands according to the rule for bhikkhus and eat it. These are the directions for it. 44. This too has three grades. Herein, there is no showing that he has had enough with respect to the first lump. But there is when he refuses more while that is being swallowed. So when one who is strict has thus shown that he has had enough, with respect to the second lump, he does not eat the second lump after swallowing the first. The median one eats also that food with respect to which he has shown that he has had enough, but the mild one goes on eating until he gets up from his seat. The moment any one of these three has eaten what has been made allowable again after he has shown that he has had enough, his ascetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. 45. The benefits are these. A one is far from committing an offense concerned with extra food. There is no overloading of the stomach. There is no keeping food back. There is no renewed search for food. He lives in conformity with the principles of fewness of wishes, and so on. 46. When a wise man refuses later food, he needs no extra search in weary mood, nor stores of food till later in the day, nor overloads his stomach in this way. So would the adept from such faults abstain. Let him assume this practice for his gain. Praised by the Blessed One, which will augment the special qualities such as content. 
This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the later food refu refusers practice. 47. The forest dwellers practice is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse an abode in a village or I undertake the forest dwellers practice. 48. Now that forest dweller must live an abode in a village in order to meet the dawn in the forest. Herein, a village abode is the village itself with its pressing. A village may consist of one cottage or several, several cottages. It may be enclosed by a wall or not, have human in inhabitants or not, and it can also be a caravan that is inhabited for more than four months. The village precincts cover the range of a stone thrown by a man of medium stature standing between the gateposts of a walled village. If there are two gateposts, as at Anuradhapura, the Vinaya experts say that this stone throw is characterized as up to the place where a throne stole, stone falls, as for instance when young men exercise their arms and throw stones in order to show off their strength. But the Sutanta ex experts say that it is up to where one throne to scare crows normal, normally falls. In the case of an unwalled village, the house precinct is where the water falls when a woman standing in the door of the outermost house of all throws water from a basin. Within a stone's throw of the kind already described from that point is the village. Within a second stone's throw is the village precinct. Mm -hmm. Forest, according to the Rimea method, firstly, is described thus Except the village and its precincts, all is forest. According to the Abhidhamma method, it is described thus Having gone out beyond the boundary posts, all that is forest. But according to the Sutanta method, its characteristic is this. A forest abode is 500 bow lengths distant. That should be defined by measuring it with a strong instructor's bow from the gatepost of a walled village or from the range of the first stone's throw from an unwalled one up to the monastery wall. But if the monastery is not walled, it is said in the Vinaya commentaries it should be measured by making the first dwelling of all the limit, or else the refectory or regular meeting place or bodhi tree or shrine, even if that is far from a dwelling belonging to a monastery. But in the Majima com commentary, it is said that omitting the precincts of the monastery and the village, the distance to be measured is that between where the two stones fall. This is the measure here. 51. Even if the village is close by and the sounds of men are audible to people in the monastery, still if it is not possible to go straight to it because of rocks, rivers, etc. in between, the 500 bow lengths can be reckoned by the road even if, if, if one has to go by boat. But anyone who blocks the path to the village here and there for the purpose of lengthening it, so as to be able to say that he is taking up the practice, is cheating the ascetic practice. 52. If a forest dwelling bhikkhu's preceptor or teacher is ill and does not get what he needs in the forest, he should take him to a village abode and attend him there. 
but he should leave in time to meet the dawn in a place proper for the practice. If the affliction increases towards the time of dawn, he must attend him and not bother about the purity of his ascetic practice. These are the directions. This too has three grades. Herein, one who is strict must always meet the dawn in the forest. The medium one is allowed to live in a village for the four month, months of the rains and the mild one for the winter months too. If in the period defined any one of these three goes from the forest and hears to the Dhamma in a village abode, his ascetic, his ascetic practice is not broken if he meets the dawn there, nor is it broken if he meets it as he is on his way back after hearing the Dhamma. But if when the preacher has got up, he thinks we shall go after lying down a while and he meets the dawn while asleep, or if of his own choice he meets the dawn while in a village abode, then his ascetic practice is broken. This is the breach in this instance. 54. The benefits are these. A forest dwelling bhikkhu who has given attention to the perception of forest, see Majjhima Nikaya 121, can obtain here there too of unobtained concentration or preserve that already ob obtained. And the master is pleased with him according as it is said. So, Nagita, I am pleased with that bhikkhu's dwelling in the forest. And when he lives in a remote abode, his mind is not distracted by unsuitable visible objects and so on. He is free from anxiety. He abandons attachment to life. He enjoys the taste of the bliss of seclusion and the state of the refused rag wearer, etc., and becomes him. 55. He lives secluded in a part. Remote abodes delights his heart. The savior of the world besides. He gladdens that in groves abides. The hermit that in woods can dwell alone may gain his the bliss as well. Whose savour is beyond the price of royal bliss in paradise? Wearing the robe of rags he may go forth into the forest to fray. Such is his mail for weapons, too, the other practices will do. One so equipped can be assured of routing Mara and his horde. So let the forest glades delight a wise man for his dwelling's sight. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, Trades, breach, and benefits in the case of the first dweller's practice. 56. The tree root dweller's practice is undertaken with one of the following statements I refuse a roof, or I undertake the tree root dweller's practice. The tree root dweller should avoid such trees as a tree near a frontier, a shrine tree, a gum tree, a fruit tree a bat's tree, a hollow tree, or a tree standing in the middle of a monastery. He can choose a tree standing on the outskirts of a monastery. These are the directions. This has three grades too. Herein, one who is strict is not allowed to have a tree that he has chosen tidied up. He can move the fallen leaves with his foot while dwelling there. The medium one is allowed to get it tidied up by those who happen to come along. The mild one can take up residence there after summoning monastery residents and novices and getting them to clear it up, level it through sand, and make a fence round with a gate fixed in it. On a special day, a tree root dweller should sit in some concealed place elsewhere rather than there. The moment any one of those three makes his abode under a roof, his ascetic practice is broken. The reciters of the Anguttara say that it is broken as soon as he knowingly meets the dawn under a roof. This is the breach in this instance. What's meant by on a special day, a tree root dweller should 
sit in some concealed place elsewhere rather than there. What's a special day in this context? It says uh, Mahadivasa, which means a great day. I mean, my assumption right away is that it means uh, a holiday or a day of uh, big activity. And there's people, actually, I don't know, to be honest, wait just a second. Yeah, it's when people, I, it must be when people are so, for some reason coming into the, coming nearby or coming, when there's lots of people walking by. But uh, I think he's got, I think he's misunderstood, just a second. But the commentary says that the idea, the reason for going to a, a uh, what does it say in English, a concealed place elsewhere, is to hide the fact that he's a tree root dweller, because he doesn't want to show it off. So it's, it, it is something to mention that um, bragging or even letting anyone know that you're keeping these is generally frowned upon. If you're going to do these, part of your practice should be not letting anyone know that you're doing them. But is that general for any practice that you do? I mean, for instance, for lay people, when they keep uh, eight or ten precepts and they are clothed in white, is that not the reason that the people know that they keep the eight or ten precepts? Yeah, but well, these ones, it's just that these practices are difficult practices. So it's its an easy thing for them to become a source of pride and therefore a source of self-aggrandizing, bragging the kind of thing that any monk would want to brag about or have other people praise them for special practices i mean these are remember this is these are actually not anything deeply profound uh, and it's easy to get i mean the, the biggest issue is it's easy to get caught up in these and to overestimate the better benefit and overestimate the accomplishment of keeping these it may not be something meditators would think of, but for new monks or for monks in general, it can be very misleading when uh, someone starts to think that they've done something special or be proud of themselves for keeping these. The Buddha said, this is just sila, so the Buddha said, this is still just, still just sticks, branches at best, branches of the, of the tree. Similar to the heartwood, one too. Yeah, it's really not a substantial accomplishment, and so so it's important to make clear that if you're going to do these, these are just as a support for your practice. They're not something to cling to as something special you're doing. On the other hand, we do revere and respect these. These are the uh, dutangas and. So when we, we undertake them with respect and we don't trivialize them, when you take them, you take them with reverence and respect and appreciate the significance in a wholesome way. You don't have to hide them. I didn't mean to suggest that you can't. You, you have to hide them. But it's um, it's valuable to not let people who don't need to know know about them like even here you know it talks about having someone prepare it for you so clearly some people know about it but it would be people who are staying in the monastery or other monks who are maybe your teacher or that sort of thing but you just try and be very careful that you're not bright you're not using it as a means of feeling good about yourself feeling proud of yourself becoming prideful, conceited. Bhante, while we're on topic, there's another question in the chat regarding referring to paragraph 49. The question is, is this saying that any region far enough from a village is a forest, even something like a desert, or is this specifically referring to forest regions? This was asked by Nita. Yeah, I believe so. A better translation is probably wilderness, and I'm pretty sure it has nothing to do with whether it's a forested region. Wilderness is probably a better translation there, or a better 
meaning anyway. Thank you, Bhante. 28. The benefits are these. The practices in conformity with the dependence because of the words, the going forth by depending on the root of a tree as an abode. It is a requisite recommended by the Blessed One thus. Valueless, easy to get, and blameless. Perception of impermanence is aroused through seeing the continual alteration of young leaves. Avarice about abodes and love of building work are absent. He dwells in the company of deities. He lives in conformity with the principles of fewness of wishes, and so on. 59. The Blessed One praised the roots of trees. As one of the dependencies, can he that loves secludedness find such another dwelling place? Seclude it at the root of trees and guard it well by deities. He lives in true devotedness, nor covets, covets any dwelling place. And when the tender leaves are seen, bright red at first, then turning green, and then to yellow as they fall, he sheds belief once and for all. In permanence three roots have been bequeathed by him, secluded sin. No wise man will disdain at all for counterplay. Letting rise and fall. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, bridge, and benefits in the case of the tree root dwellers' practice. The open air dwellers' practice is undertaken with one of the following statements I refuse a roof and a tree root, or I undertake the open air dwellers' practice. An open-air dweller is allowed to enter the Uposata house for the purpose of hearing the Dhamma or for the purpose of the Uposata. If it rains while he is inside, he can go out when the rain is over, instead of going out while it is still raining. He is allowed to enter the eating hall or the fire room in order to do the duties or to go under a roof or to ask elder bhikkhus in the eating hall about a meal, or when teaching and taking lessons, or to take beds, chairs, etc., inside that have been wrongly left outside. If he is going along a road with a requisite belonging to a senior and it rains, he is allowed to go into a wayside rest house. If he has nothing with him, he is not allowed to hurry to get to a rest house, but he can go at his normal pace, enter it, stay there as long as it rains. These are the directions for it. And the same rule applies to the tree root dweller, too. This has three grades, too. Herein, one who is strict is not allowed to live near a tree or a rock or a house. He should make a robe tent right out in the open and live in that. The medium one is allowed to live near a tree or a rock or a house so long as he is not covered by them. The mild one is allowed these. A rock overhang without a drip ledge cut in it. A hut of branches. Cloth stiffened with paste and a tent treated as a fixture that has been left by field watchers, and so on. The moment any one of these three goes under a roof or to a tree root to dwell there, his ascetic practice is broken. The reciters of the Anguttara say that it is broken as soon as he knowingly meets the dawn there. This is the breach in this case. 62. The benefits are these. The impediment of dwellings is severed. Stiffness and torpor are expelled. His conduct deserves the praise. 
Like deer, the bhikkhus live unattached and homeless. He is detached. He is free to go in any direction. He lives in conformity with the principles of fewness of wishes, and so on. 63. The open air provides a life that aids the homeless bhikkhu strife. Easy to get and leaves his mind alert as a deer so he shall find stiffness and torpor brought to halt under the star-bejeweled vault. The moon and sun furnishes light and concentration is delight. The joy seclusion savor gives he shall discover soon who lives in open air and that is why the wise prefer the open sky. This is the commentary on the undertaking, directions, grades, breach, and benefits in the case of the open air dwellers practice. I wanted to ask a question about the verse in 59, uh, the very last sentence, or the very last uh, row is saying for contemplating. And I think he put, put there rise and fall. So I'm just curious what the Pali is saying there. I think it's just bhavana if I'm reading correctly. Is this uh, probably Anapanasati? Just bhavana. For a place, it's a place, bhavana birat dalayang. A place for delighting in bhavana. Mm -hmm. Development, yeah, right? Yeah. Dasmahi Buddha Dayajang. It's a Dayaja. The, yeah. One who inherits. Yeah. Um, and the heir to the Buddha. Dasmahi. The, uh, therefore, the heir to the Buddha who is looking for delight in mental development should not despise seclusion. And yeah, I don't quite understand the very end, but it's basically should um could stay at the root of a tree. Mm -hmm. Oh right, I think what it is is um so a wise person, a vichakana, one who sees clearly. Vichakana mm -hmm. is an interesting word because chaka is chaku is uh, is the eye, and we so it's like vipassana with clear eyes. Clear vision, chaksana. Chaksana is an interesting word. I don't, don't really know that word. But it's related to the eye, which is chaku. We chakana is like vipassana. It's just another way of saying vipassana, really. So, sorry, it's actually split up a little differently. Yeah, he, I mean, you have to, he, he, went a, he goes a little too far, perhaps, in trying to make it rhyme in English. But it's, uh, therefore, indeed, one who is a heir to the Buddha, one, if one desires to find delight in bhavana, but it could alaya could also be a abode. So I don't know if that's what it means. A place where one can delight in bhavana in meditation. Vivitang nati One should not dis disparage um, seclusion. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one who sees clearly should not disparage seclusion and live at the root of a tree. Or the, the one should one who sees clearly should not disparage the seclusion of staying at the root of a tree. Wow, that's pretty different, Bante. Yeah. I was wondering why he put there the in the brackets uh, uh, rise and fall, basically. Or what does that? But this is like yeah. how you translate it is different. It has a slightly different meaning. Anyway, thank you. 64. The charnel ground dwellers practice is undertaken with one of the following statements. I refuse what is not a charnel ground or I undertake the charnel ground dwellers practice. 
Now the charnel ground dwellers should not live in some place just because the people who built the village have called it the charnel ground, for it is not a charnel ground unless a dead body has been burnt on it. But as soon as one has been burnt on it, it becomes a charnel ground, or even if it has been neglected for a dozen years, it is so still. 65. One who dwells there should not be the sort of person who gets logs, pavilions, etc. built, has beds and chairs set out and drinking and washing water kept ready and preaches dharma. For this ascetic practice is a momentous thing. Whoever goes to live there should be diligent. And he should first inform the senior elder of the order of the king's local representative in order to prevent trouble. When he walks up and down, he should do so looking at the pyre with half an eye. On his way to the charnel ground, he should avoid the main roads and take a bypath. He should define all the objects there while it is day so that they will not assume frightening shapes for him at night. Even if non-human beings wander about screeching, he must not hit them with anything. It is not allowed to miss going to the charnel ground even for a single day. The reciters of the Anguttara say that after spending the middle watch in the charnel ground, he is allowed to leave in the last watch. He should not take such food as sesame flour, peas, pudding, fish, meat, milk, oil, sugar, etc., which are liked by non-human beings. He should not enter the homes of families. These are the directions for it. Do people still practice this? Do people still practice this? Yeah. I know of one, I mean, there's many, but I, I've stayed at a monastery that had a charnel ground. But uh, the description is, it's not like, like he's uh, living there, right? It's not a dweller there, right? Yeah. Where he, he goes there, in, Stays a while and he can go back. Well, you don't have to leave. You don't have to live there twenty-four hours a day, but I believe uh -huh. you're supposed to stay there all night. Not allowed to miss going to the charnel ground. I mean, the idea is you live there, so but of course, anywhere you live doesn't mean you have to stay there all the time because you still have to go for alms. But the practice would be to go back and stay in the in the charnel ground, though I suppose. Because of the food thing that you don't, you wouldn't want to eat there because you wouldn't want to bring food that would attract, I don't know, whatever what he means by non human beings. Whatever he means by that. The um, the monumental thing, it just says Garuka. It's just a heavy, it's a weighty thing. I mean, it's not a bad translation, but perhaps monumental is a bit over the top. Just pointing out that it's weighty because. It can be a it can be a, a a big undertaking for some people. Many people are very afraid of non-human beings. Although, to be honest, if uh, the, the the reason many people aren't is because they've never encountered one, and I think many people who think they aren't afraid is do are not afraid just because they believe they don't exist and would be very freaked out if they came across a non-human being. Sixty-six. This has three grades too. Herein, one who is strict should live where there are always burnings and corpses in mourning. The medium one is allowed to live where there is one of these three. The mild one is allowed to live in a place that possesses the bare characteristics of a charnel ground, already stated. When any one of these three makes his abode in some place not a charnel ground, his ascetic practice is broken. It is on the day on which he does not go to the charnel ground that Anguttara reciters say. This is the breach in this case. The benefits are these. He acquires mindfulness of death. He lives diligently. 
The sign of foulness is available. Greed for sense desires is removed. He constantly sees the body's true nature. He has a great sense of urgency. He abandons vanity of health, etc. He vanquishes fear and dread. Non-human beings respect and honor him. He lives in conformity with the principles of fewness of wishes, and so on. Do all um, monks are buried by being um, burned? And uh, every does that imply that every monastery has a charnel ground? Not everyone, no. Some do. Most don't. But yeah, we don't bury, nobody buries uh, bodies here. I don't know what people do with the ashes here normally. I mean, monks can have their ashes put in a stupa. But yeah, actually, that's um, that's common for the, well, I guess that's common for important monks. They get a stupa, even just a small one. I don't know what people do otherwise. What do they do in Sri Lanka? Trying to think what we did with uh, well, the monastery I was staying at. The head monk died while I was there. He died while I was dying of dengue. <laughs> really. And then, so when I got back, they had uh, they set up a, set up a funeral pyre in our monastery. Just made one out of logs, and uh, we, I was sat there and watched him burn. Couldn't see much because he was covered up in a lot of logs, but. Did sit there for a while. So there, that was a charnel ground <laughs> practice of sorts. But we were all kind of doing it, you know, just watching the fire burn. But I'm not sure they do with the. I guess I guess if they burn it like that outdoors, the the ashes are just fall to the ground and that's it. But I don't think they do like that very much in Thailand. I'm not really sure. I know funerals are a big deal here in Thailand. Bante, I remember the story that uh, we re read somewhere. I'm not sure where. Um, or, or I remember the story of the courtesan whose body was um, asked by the Buddha to be put uh, in the charner ground and everyone can what, go, could go and look. And uh, so I, I, I understand why that's a good practice. Because you can see the faces, how the body is decomposing, basically. So if if the body is burned and you just see the ashes, maybe some little bones or something. Like I don't see how. Why would anyone call that charnel ground? Well, people are afraid of death and afraid of spirits. The idea is that spirits stick around even after the body is burnt. And and I guess charnel grounds also attract demons or something. I'm not really sure. There, there's lots of ideas. I, mean, I think it's just a scary thing thinking that people have died, have, have bodies have been, dead bodies have been put here. It's like a cemetery. People are afraid of going to the cemetery at night. Yeah, so is that a different practice where you you can observe a decomposing body and uh, the charner ground yeah. dwellers practice? Yes, oh, okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Like people are even afraid of, of of the dark, you know. Monks staying in the forest. It's it is a bit creepy staying in the forest in the middle of the night if you've never lived in the forest, especially when you're all alone. But then, on top of that, to be in a in a in a sem in a place where people have died, it's just it makes people. I mean, I think it's more for for new meditators, you know, those of you, those of those who have done substantial meditation, kind of wonder what's the big deal. <laughs> Why is this such a big deal? Mm. But you have to watch people who haven't really meditated. Some people would 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 just absolutely 
reject the idea immediately of going to stay in a charnel ground, completely petrified with fear. I think one thing after cremation, uh, uh, according to what I remember, uh, uh, Buddha recommended to make stupa if one is an anagami or about but what do they do in Sri Lanka with dead? What do they do with dead people in Sri Lanka? Do they scatter the ashes? Uh, the lay people they take the ashes, some keep it in some special place, or just put it here on the river or the sea, something like that. They do that, huh? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure about monks because I haven't mm. seen. Probably some the same. Yeah. So they so these places are not called cemeteries, right? Cemetery, I think, is where you bury people. Yeah, so it's a different. Are there restrictions for bikunis for so, some of the rules that we read about? For instance, is a bikuni allowed to be a tree dweller or an open air dweller? That... That will all be all be addressed further on, if I remember correctly. So we've now passed the hour. If anyone has any questions, you may ask it. I don't know again if I'm allowed to ask, but uh, at one rule it was specified that the Biko needs to announce the uh, his perceptor about. Uh, uh, the undertaking uh, one of those practices, but um, is it the case for all all the others, or uh, are they are there cases when the preceptor recommends a bhikkhu to practice? Yeah, I think it actually mentions talks about that later on as well. But yeah, some some. Teachers recommend them but don't practice them. Some practice them but don't recommend them. Some both practice them and recommend them. Some neither recommend them nor practice them. I think it says that somewhere. I'm wondering why Western culture is not afraid of going to these cemeteries or these places. And uh, is it? You mentioned maybe it is because we didn't see these type of beings, didn't encounter these type of beings. But do you think uh, the Thai people, for example, did? So it's more common that there are, is it just fear in their mind? Well, I think there's there's more of a belief that they actually exist. Mm -hmm. Not the direct experience. Bhante, Mila wanted to ask, aren't these practices too extreme with mosquitoes and the heat these days? It would be difficult to live under a tree. Well, difficult's not so bad. What's the problem with difficulty? It would be more difficult to live in the open air in this kind of heat. You might you might get really sick if you tried to stand out in the open air, out under the sun. So you'd probably pick a season, pick a better season to do it. I mean, you could potentially get sick, and with the rain and everything, I don't know. It the... doesn't make you sick. Mm -hmm. uh, you could potentially get sick, but that's part of life. I mean, we're not trying to avoid sickness. I don't know. I suppose to, you might try to avoid sickness. I'm a little. I avoid sickness a little more because I have to teach. Like if I got sick, if I do get sick, it's going to be a bit of a big deal. You know, be a few days where it'll be hard to teach. But when you're just practicing, you know, sickness can be taken as a part of a part of your practice. Thank you, Bhante. Like in our tradition, if people come for a short time, I would also recommend that they be careful not to get sick because they have limited time. But again, for a monk living on their own, they're practicing long term. They're not really concerned about things like sickness. 
I mean, well, they don't have to be, but uh, you know, many monks are, and it's not terrible if they are, because you think if you get sick, then you have to go to you have to go walk for alms. It can be a bit of a challenge to walk for alms when you're sick, and then so maybe some other monk has to bring you food and and you, you're burdened, so you think, oh, I better not get sick. So, I mean, you can be somewhat conscientious in keeping these, and of course you don't have to keep any of these. These are extra practices. Ponte, in um, paragraph 67, the, it, it translates, something translates as uh, he abandons vanity of health and wondering what that really is in uh, in uh, in the Pali. Probably Pamada, which is negligent, which is like vanity of health. What sixty? What sixty? Sixty-seven. The very last one that we read. That's Arogya Mother, right, Bhante? Yeah, Madda, right? Not Pamada, Madda. Like infatuation of health and... Yeah, drunk, that's right, it's the intoxication. Yeah, so, I mean, like what my, Mila was saying, it's it's kind of like with these practices, uh, one, the monk would be, like, challenging themselves, right? And even... Uh, on purpose, putting themselves possibly to experience some sickness, no? Um, I don't think so. This is the this is under the this there's nothing there's nothing there's nothing about a charnel ground that specifically makes you sick. It's more about uh, the contemplation of dead people, I think. And it doesn't just say... Yeah, it's vanity of health, etc. It's vanity of things, including health. So there's youth. health and youth. Youth, and I think. Life. Yes. Mm. So it, it's not quite clear in English, but it's vanity of things like health. Is the idea? It's vanity of those things the Buddha talked about. Vanity, starting with health. There's a specific list. For these practices, uh, are they undertaken uh, for a specific period of time, and the time is declared, or how how is that done? Um, I'm not sure. Didn't didn't it mention something about that? I mean, it. it it obviously can be it's up to the practitioner, right? But is that specified when they decide to undertake the practice? No. You, uh, I mean, suppose you could. There's no rule against that. But normally, I think, I think you... There's a way we have in in our book. I think in our book, the chanting book, there's the way of uh, keeping these samadhiyami. So I think the opposite of samadhiyami is probably niki nikipami. Yeah, it's nikipami. So you just change the poly when you're ready to give it up. And of course, if you break it, then it's already given up. You can just break it, but. I think there's a way of actually giving it up. So here you would say, I don't know what the first part would become. So sanik, so sanikang kang nikipami. I think I think there's something like that. So as I understand, the practices are not undertaken with some period of time in mind, but the bhikkhu can decide uh, while he is practicing when to stop? I mean, I don't think it's cut and dried like that. Sure, someone could. 
It's not that it's not like there's one specific way to do it. Someone wants to do it, say for this month I'm gonna do the Dutangas. They can do it like that. So I assume there they would be doing these practices so that they can further they on the path, right? So it this these will would help them become enlightened. I assume yeah. there are many stories like this. So I was just thinking that it makes sense that you would do it, the practices until you reach your goal, basically, no? If you have a quote-unquote goal in mind. Well, I, mean, I think you'd probably undertake it as long as you saw it helpful for that goal. You might find at mm -hmm. some point that you have to break it because of change in circumstances, so you just break it. Or you might find that it's not helping you with your practice, it's turning out to just make you stressed or something like that. Some cases, I mean, it, probably not, but there may be cases where for some people these are actually problematic. They're probably good for everybody, if, they're, if they're, it's proper to keep them. Like if you are a monk, it's probably good. They're probably good to keep all of them as many as you can. I guess for new med new meditators, um, it would be it would be harmful because they would they would not have the mindfulness to to cope with the hardships, and so they'd get to freak out and they'd get stressed and they'd get they just get very, very much obsessed with disliking and worry and that sort of thing, fear. So you have to be undertaken carefully and by people who feel that they're ready to take them. Yeah, it's exactly what I, I'm thinking or I'm trying to wrap my mind around. Like, you have to feel ready for it. Um, I mean, kind of feel like the conditions are right uh, or ripe, basically, for this. No, like you can still force it on yourself, but it, I, I imagine if you force it on yourself, it won't work. Well, honestly, I mean, if someone is practicing mindfulness, that's that, that makes it or practicing meditation in general, that makes all of these... Po I think that's what makes all of these possible. And if someone is practicing mindful mm -hmm. meditation, if one practices these, thinking, I'm going to do this as a precursor to actual meditation practice, I would say, generally speaking, there shouldn't be any problem with any of these, uh, provided one actually does devote themselves to meditation, even samatha meditation. But then how about the causes and conditions that have to be ripe for enlightenment, for example? So the factors of enlightenment, basically. I don't, I don't quite get the question. I mean, you, you, these are supportive of meditation practice, and meditation practice allows you to, well, they're supportive of these practices, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. But enlightenment comes from meditation. It doesn't really come just from these practices. Yeah, that answers my question, Bhante. Thank you. In the note 16 on the bottom of page 71, uh, there is an explanation why a bhikkhu uh, is not supposed to enter uh, one's house because he should not go into family's houses because he smells of that of the dead and is followed by pisacha goblins. Uh, what what are those goblins? Uh, I don't know. It's a type of evil spirit. There are petas. Uh... Umbandas, Pisachas, and Yapkas. Well, 
Well, uh, not all the petas are like evil, evil, right? They're... I mean, yeah, it depends. But petas are they are uh, belonging to the peta realm, which means they are below humans. Below what? Below human realm. Like they are. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So if they follow you, uh, they, they will be following you with uh, bad intentions. Unless, I mean, they are looking for merit, something. And he smells of the bed, dead is the smoke of the dead. Smells of the smoke of the dead. And people, that, that's not pleasant for people. People will be disturbed by that. When they smell, smell the smoke on him and they know it's the smoke of a burning dead body. When we are going to retreats, we are asked to sign that paper um, my question is what happens uh, when a person would die in in a retreat would they be burned there or or what happen i guess their family would be called okay well have a good week everyone thank you all for coming okay, uh, thank you Andy. Uh -huh. Sadhu, 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 Sadh